Ooh, that'll work nicely. Yes. Uh, that's that's not that um, spell book you found a while back, is it, Pruitt? Like. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying a couple things. That's all. Just don't move. Hold on. Turn the bell. Learn some new tricks since your last uh, attempt to subvert my will. Oh, Pruitt. Well, you've been studying abjuration. Yes, I have. Why don't we go ahead and talk about it on WebDM? <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Lasers and Liches, a complete Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition retro-futurist sourcebook with new player classes, adventures, magic items, neon spells, code dragons, pizza slimes, keytars, dinosaurs, and they've even got freaking laser corgis. This book is a complete neon overhaul of 5th edition that'll make you feel like you're watching cartoons on Saturday morning. Kickstarter ends on March 14th, 2019 and 400 pages of playtest content will be available to backers almost immediately after the Kickstarter ends. This project funded in 30 minutes, guys. It's awesome. Check it out. Link here and in the description. Okay, Jim. In defense of abjuration, go. Mm. Mm. Uh, I mean, I guess, what is abjuration before we start defending it? Before we start defending it. 44 paltry little spells. It is a school that, as I've looked into it and prepared for this this conversation, Mm -hmm. I've come to appreciate more, and I like its eclectic and disjointed uh, (laughs) focus. It is a school with a strong theme, but if you're looking for mechanical consistency or the usual internal consistency to a D&D spell school, Mm -hmm. it's not here. Abjuration spells, according to the PHP, are spells that are protective in nature, although they have some uh, aggressive uses. That would be spells like, say, Glyph of Warding, or they kind of like, you know, blast. Uh, the subject, uh, protect an area, and cause damage to creatures while they're in it, that kind of thing. They can also create magical barriers, although not always, because not all the wall spells are in abjuration. Uh, right. But uh, they're usually magical barriers that we're talking about here are those that are uh, personal and protective in nature, shield, mage armor, things like that, or hedge out other spells, global yeah. vulnerability, anti-magic uh, field. Anti-life shell. Anti-life shell would be another type of magical barrier. Uh, they're spells that negate harmful effects, right? Uh, greater or lesser restoration, remove curse, curse, things like that. In that sense, uh, the negating harmful effects and some of the other things they do, particularly like banishing other creatures, it's almost kind of like um, a metamagic school, like not in the sorcerer's sense of like altering spells to create different effects or to change the parameters of a spell. It's spells about spells. Yeah. These are spells that affect other spells or spells that affect magical effects. So that is, of course, greater uh, restoration, lesser restoration, uh, dispel good and evil. Um, I think it's another good one uh, in that vein. Forbiddance. Forbiddance, sure, uh, is one like that. And then, of course, there are uh, spells that also harm trespassers. Forbiddance, certain type of trespassers like that. The various guardian spells. Mm. Oh, yeah, um, guards and wards. Guards and wards will do that, glyph of warding. The, all the ones that summon, like, a force or thing that sits somewhere, like guardian of the faithful or faithful hound or things like that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, are, are also spells that can mess with uh, and, and affect uh, trespassers mm-hmm. and the like. So these are obviously effects that are, could potentially belong in other spell schools. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of them summon magical energies that could be in conjuration or evocation or things yeah, like yeah. that. But Faithful Hound is a conjuration, by the way. Ah, my bad on Faithful Hound. Uh, but but as you know, there's <laughs> that's the one where there's there's three there's a trio of spells that are all I think fourth level or fourth mm-hmm. or fifth level that all do a similar thing. There's Guardian of the Faith, Faithful Hound, and then the, the Guardian, one. yeah, the Guardian of uh, Nature is another one. That's a polymorph effect. The one that has the guy that hangs out right behind you. We'll get our spell names uh, right one of these days. The school is very thematic, mm-hmm. and in that sense, it's themed around protection, and it tends to be proactive, right? So when you when you think maybe like, oh, well, negate harmful effects. Well, like, why no healing? Like, why is uh, healing's a harmful effect or, or damages rather? And we might want healing to come from abjuration. Uh, well, there is some healing there. Aid is an abjuration effect. Uh, and aid represents proactive healing, right? Yeah. A, a buffer uh, before you really start taking damage. As an aside, the fact that healing magic can be found in like five different schools in 5th edition, I think speaks to the fact that we shouldn't see healing magic as coming from one source and should instead look at uh, healing magic as being something that a great many schools of magic have a contribution to rather than just like all healing magic 
it comes from the positive energy plane. And that's just a tangent uh, for that. So, Or could it be just there's <clears throat> different ways to access the positive energy plane? I mean, is aid just like a buffer of, of positive energy you put around yourself? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. That represents the hit points you would have taken, but yeah. you don't. It's in this sense that I see mag the schools of magic in Dungeons and Dragons as representing two things. And one of them is stated in the PHB. And that's obvious in the intent of the designers, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also the fiction of this school that has nothing, well, it has very little to do with what, you know, the, the people that design the game want. It has to do how it, it plays, because it, it might play a different way. And the way it plays suggests that the schools of magic are not just like uh, discrete magical energies, but also represent practices and approaches and philosophies to magic that are then mixed with this magical force that's in the world. Um, and abjuration is one focused around uh, protection, as well as uh, a, a magic that affects magic. Counterspell, dispel, um, anti-magic uh, field, as we mentioned. That's a, that's a really uh, powerful idea. Yeah. And, and an interesting thing that I think at first glance might get passed over is like, ah, I got Mage Armor Shield, I'm good. So, you know, I'll, I'll pick up Dispel and Counterspell, you know, at third level when mm -hmm. I get those, you know. But other than that, you know, you're, you're over here in other concepts. They're, you know, dabbling with the forces of the universe and, and the like, and not necessarily uh, spending time with abjuration. I'm like, well, this could be a, there are concepts here that could work really well in of themselves. Yeah, yeah. What are some favorite or standout spells in mm -hmm. abjuration for you? The cantrips are lackluster. Right. Uh, you mean all two of them? Both of them. So I, I, I don't really start with the cantrips like we do with most of these. Uh, and so for first level, uh, the, the big ones are ceremony and protection from evil and good. I know that major armor, the, the collective gasp of, of not having major armor and shield being my favorite. I don't, they're not my favorite because they're ubiquitous. Yeah. And I get tired of the fact that um, it seems as though it, they are assumed and, and sort of like, necessary you know and for me they are spells i will take reluctantly on a wizard begrudgingly because i don't want to be hit in combat a bunch yeah which is why you would take them in the first place and it start leads me to think like well couldn't this just be an ability that mages get if everybody's taking this spell then maybe it is <laughs> but uh, that's a different conversation to have Ceremony. Yeah, those are signature spells, <laughs> I like ceremony because it's multi-use. I like any multi-use spell. Yeah. I like any spell that has a lot of functionality. I like it because it's a world-building spell. It feels like a spell that would exist in these worlds. Then there are other spells that are like this across all the schools, and most of them either tend to be the ones created by players that ended up in the game. Bigby's hand feels like a spell that a real person would have invented because they're just like, I just love hands and I'm just obsessed with them and I gotta mm -hmm. make a big magical one. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and or like Tarantino's like, feet. That's what he would make. Right, exactly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they could just come and stomp and squish you up. Mon and, <laughs> Monty's feet. Tensor's transformation is another one of those, right? Like it's uh, or not just Tensor's transformation, but all of Tensor's spells. Uh, yeah. A wizard uh, who, who wants to be able to carry things and be big and brawny and the yeah. like, you know. Um, and so uh, the abjuration spells Wizard uh, wants to be buff wizard. Ceremony feels that way. It yeah. feels like a spell created by someone that lives in one of these worlds because they're yeah. like, oh yeah, I need to be able to bless these sorts of life events and things that happen. It makes the cleric a priest, mm -hmm. right? It makes them an emissary from their god or, or goddess or faith that, that allows them to give a benefit to people. And, and, and you can really sort of see a, you know, the use of, say, ceremony and minor curing spells and sort of like the, the, the low-level uh, beneficial and aiding type spells as being like the, the bread and butter magic that a, uh, a wandering cleric might mm -hmm. cast, you know? Yeah, I got to cast ceremony uh, in a game not too long ago. Yeah. It was pretty great. It was a very weird scenario, but we had a, a makeshift wedding and, and I cast it. Yeah. And then we killed the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, but at least it was sanctified. At least, yes, right. at least it was sanctified by my god. I mean, the god of war. So, right. anyway. I can see there being uh, parties who would attempt to abuse some of these things, but the benefits from them are rather, uh, you know, limited. And, and, mm -hmm. and you know, you, you could also say, like, yeah, well, you might have gotten married for the magical benefit of this, but that your god still, like, you guys uh, bound your union with my magic, so that doesn't come without some kind of cost, mm -hmm. right? You know. Uh, there's always consequences for uh, for that kind of behavior. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I came for the magical benefit. I stayed for the companion. Right. Long-winded introduction to ceremony. Uh, protection from evil and good is another big one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I like it because I hate having my character be mind controlled, and some of the most uh, you know you know mind controlling enemies are undead and fiends and things like that. So being able to hedge out uh, you know those is good. I like it for paladins. 
I like it for any kind of like classically good uh, sort of character. I like it for all kinds of wizards because they deal with extra planar entities and mm -hmm. things like that. An interesting spell to, to have and I think a good protection spell because when you need it, you, you really need it. And uh, you know, as your character advances in, in levels, you start to go like, what am I going to do with my first level spells? And I see protection from evil and good as one of those that always stays on my list. Yeah. That I, I'm going to have it throughout my level. It's kind of like Fog Cloud or, or other ones where I'm like, this will always be useful. Uh, in terms of abjuration magic, that's protection from evil and good. Yeah. Yeah. I really like Sanctuary at that lower lower level. Especially yeah. if you're like either the cleric, you need to run around doing your cleric-y thing. Yeah. Or if you want to be more of um, you can get it cast on you as a wizard and you're mm -hmm. more of like a... a a buff wizard, not really yeah, a yeah. buff wizard. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. You're bolstering others. You're bolstering and others, and you're doing mm -hmm. things to, to to help your side. Right. I mean, having a sanctuary cast on you, that's, that's well, to me, a hell of a lot better than a shield or whatever. Well, particularly if you're using your concentration to provide a benefit, and, and that's primarily what you're doing, and you could be casting other spells and, and contributing in that way, but maybe the, the spell that you're concentrating on is important enough that you don't want to risk losing it to damage. Maybe because you're summoning some kind of creature or something, or you're maintaining an effect that's allowing the party to exist in this particular location using a custom creation or something. Anything that we're like, I want the enemy to avoid me, Sanctuary's uh, good for. So yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. What are some other uh, of your faves? Glyph of Warding was mm -hmm. a really fun one. They changed the wording on the spell. I remember when we first sort of talked about it, it was up for interpretation as to what sort of magic could be cast into a spell glyph on a glyph of warding. It seems like they've changed the, the wording on it so that it's pretty clear. It's like, you, you can cast spells that target creatures, spells that target areas. The glyph of warding will concentrate on this. It really is one of those spells where if you've got time and the resources to cast a lot of these and, and a place where you can have ready access to them, glyph of warding's a, should, there's just kind of like, well, there's always a, a fly nearby or always a, a quick heal. Mm -hmm. uh, or something like that, and because it bypasses concentration, you can get those combos that you weren't always able to get. Um, and you can say, you know, be running around with like a stone skin and invisibility and a fly, and now you start looking like a third edition wizard. Yeah. Um, because you've say got a potion, a couple of glyphs, and then you actually use your concentration on something else. Would you say that we abused it in your Starward Bound game, or, or not your Starward Bound, the, the, the precursor to Starward Bound, the first Spelljammer game. Oh, like, you mean where you Our ships were covered where you, in glyphs. You had your, your ships completely covered in glyphs of like healing and flying and, and yeah. whatever. Um, and all, yeah. Well, but that started because we kept having crew members die for lack of healing, and then it was like, we'll just leave a lot of low-level healing glyphs about. Yeah, and they and, know they can come over here they, to this mast, yep. touch this glyph. Touch this thing, yeah. And then it was like, well, we could, they could also fly, they could also be invisible, they mm -hmm. could also summon things, yeah. And I we know, had like... I mean, you know, I... Y'all I, did the work, you yeah. had the resources. Sure. Um, but yeah. also, by the time we were the, of the level that we, that was possible, that we, would, that we would look at, say, 60 days of downtime while we were traveling between locations and calculating out and going like, yes, we have enough resources to cast like 12 glyphs. We'd also proceeded out of an area of play where like being boarded and having lots of like fights on our ship, which our white knuckle had left us. We were no longer that low level where we got to worry about being boarded by a crew of orcs because like, oh, there's a crew of orcs on this ship. It's just like, yawn. Like, yeah. you know, uh, and, and so I, I, what I found was that the, the game kind of corrects this problem for itself because by the time you can abuse this spell, you've passed out of the, the, the realm where abuse of the spell would be a big problem and are now sort of like, well, yeah, who cares? Like, well, I mean, we, somebody could attack us at our castle. You guys had the castle in War of the Dragon Queen uh, mm -hmm. game. Oh, the one up north? Ago, right. Yeah. The one that's in the Mirror of Dead Men. And, and I remember you guys talking about setting all those glyphs around the teleportation circle and like being ultra paranoid that the Cult of the Dragon was going to teleport back into the castle and take it back over. And like a hallway lined with glyphs on the ceiling, the walls, all kinds of triggers. Yeah, we went kind of nuts with that. Yeah. It never came up. Yeah. I just assumed they were scrying on us. And <laughs> yeah, they, they saw, saw that and they were up. like, no. Nah. <laughs> in which case... It worked. I, I think at the time I, I figured that they would assume that that's what had happened. You know, when your enemy takes over a castle that you have, that has uh, your teleportation circle, it's a risk to go back there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a risk. So they just decided not to risk it. Planar binding is a fun one. Lots of things oh. you can do with planar oh, binding. Oh yeah. 
Uh, and of course you need a lot of different, I, I think it works well uh, for multiple casters, right? Where mm -hmm. multiple casters are there, one person conjuring the creature that's to be bound, another person's concentrating on that, uh, on protecting everyone else and keeping that creature contained in the magic circle, and then there's the, 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 you know, the caster who's like binding it to this reality in the terms of service. I, I think it's fun from a player, you know, sort of like a group of PCs where, you know, maybe they have to summon a terrifying and horrible creature and you'd want an abjurer around for that, right? Like you'd want someone there that's able to deal with these creatures. And yeah. Yeah, any for you, like any, any that stand out? Well, I mean, I've always been a fan of Warding Bond, played a lot of low level clerics, uh -huh. and Warding Bond is just a great one to throw on either the really squishy guy in the party, oh, sure. or if you have an absolute tank, if you want to make them like an uber tank, throw a Warding Bond on your bear totem barbarian. <laughs> where half of the damage that has already been halved, halves again. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, eh. I think I've been a player in one of those where we've been like a paladin and, and I, first off, having, you know, having damage with a paladin is nice. You know, it's like yeah. no, we being did, able yeah, to we do did that. that in Curse of Strahd. That's what yeah, we, we did. it literally all the time. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> Life Cleric, I'm, I'm healing myself when I heal you. <laughs> Right. It was, a, yeah, the, yeah a Devotion Paladin and Life Clerk was a fun duo for that. And a lot of abjurations were, you know, it was a, it was a duo that, like, really lent itself well to a lot of abjurations because yeah. we, we were going to endure fights. Exactly. And, you know, but, you know, basically playing two-player in a, in a module, you have to kind of, like, approach combat and, and, and those kind of challenges yeah. a bit differently. But the uh, fact... Would. Yeah. Oh, tell, but This the kind of magic allows that to be possible. Yeah. <laughs> but the fact that it's, what, eight hours and no concentration? Yeah. I mean... Yeah, it's nice. Come it, on. No for concentration, but yeah. For giving someone resistance to all damage, basically. Well, and that's, that's the sort of thing right there, because it provides this damage resistance, but it doesn't have concentration itself. And when I look at a spell like Stone Skin, and I go, okay, the, the, the damage mitigation that comes from that, it's like, but I'm still taking some damage, making me having to roll that concentration uh, mm -hmm. check. Now I'm, I, I'm less likely to take Stone Skin and cast it, say, on myself, and more likely to cast it on someone else, mm -hmm. who could benefit from, from having something like that. And I think it's maybe similar with Warding Bond, except you don't have the you know the concentration component that stone skins has. Uh, and then I would say the other one got to be counterspell. Uh -huh. But yeah. we need we need to do a deep dive on counterspell cuz counterspell yeah, right. it, it's <laughs> it's that spell. Yeah. Right? It's okay. like it was introduced in 5th edition, right? There is a history of counterspelling throughout Dungeons and Dragons and I remember with, Oh, with readying a dispel. Yeah, rules for it in 2nd edition and 3rd edition it was if you had the exact version of the spell you could counter a spell with that version, or if you had to spell magic, you could use it. And there were subclasses based around it, but I don't remember anyone ever counter spelling in third edition. Uh, I don't know if fourth edition had it because I didn't play enough fourth edition, in it, but it's it's sort of like the big one of the big standout spells of fifth, and one of those that seems to cause a lot of contention and headaches mm -hmm. and people who. Uh, don't like the type of uh, gameplay that overuse of counterspell provides, and then those people who don't like the fact that it sort of like shuts things down. I'm on the fence about counterspell. Yeah. I have a, a skepticism about any spells that seem like they're must have, because to me that suggests that other spells that are there in, in, in that share the same level with them could maybe use a boost or some love mm -hmm. to, uh, to get them to be, uh, you know, cast more often. Uh, it, mostly just because I, it's, you know, you get tired of seeing the same spells cast all the time. It's a variety. It's a, a, a spell that works or it, or it doesn't now. It doesn't have to, right? There's a roll if you try to counter something that's higher level. And then, uh, but even that touches on several things about the way this spell interacts with the game mechanics that are fuzzy and require some DM adjudication and require some conversation between player and dungeon master, mm -hmm. uh, or in this case, probably party and dungeon master, um, just because it's like, how do you, are we gonna announce what spell is being cast? I don't usually. I usually just say, it looks like your enemy's casting a spell. And if there's a circumstance that would allow a player to have some insight into that, I'll, I'll offer that information, but to me, in my mind, that, that normally would require them having um, either knowing that spell that's being cast, like, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's this particular spell, or you know, having like detect magic up and seeing the energies of magic being gathered before they're released uh, and being able to identify the spell. There are the spell identification rules in Xanathar's Guide, but they take a reaction, which you then can't use for constant or for your counter spell. Yeah. So <laughs> you have to have the one guy doing his reaction. He's casting a fireball. Uh, yeah. And letting this and guy letting use his reaction it, yeah. to counter spell. Uh, you know, maybe that kind of teamwork is, you know, what you're in for. Be, and consider this, right? Like uh, you might be an abjurer wizard who's really uh, 
good at getting counter spells and, and having them uh, low level counter spell land on a higher level spell, but you don't want to use your reaction. And you also don't have that great of an arcana, right? Because you, even though you're an intelligence caster, you don't have expertise or, or something in arcana, uh, unless you're an edge case that can get that. But maybe you have a lore bard or a knowledge cleric or something in the party that can get, a, get better scores on their arcana check to sort of uh, notice that. And then it is a, a matter of, uh, you, you know, a, a teamwork that, yeah, this one, they're like a savant for identifying a spell as it's being cast mm -hmm. and, and then relaying that information. That's one way to approach it if you want to use those optional rules. I, I like the fact that it's a gamble. It's a, first off, it's a reaction spell. It's a snap decision. I, I see magic being cast and I work quickly to unravel it. You don't know if what's being cast is a cantrip. You don't know what's being cast as a powerful spell. The only thing you would know about it is if you have to roll, it's higher than third level. But even then, I wouldn't reveal that information until the player told me what level of spell they were going to use for it. To me, that is a powerful curb on the abuse of, of, of counter spell. Oh, definitely. Right, yeah. like if, if, the, if the player doesn't know. Now, there are people who will say, well, that's not an informed choice on the player's part. And I would counter with like, well, yeah, it's, it's a risk reward. You don't know what you're, you, you know you're stopping something. I don't know what. You know. I'm gonna counter, no. The, and then that comes up with the other issue of it, right? Yeah. Which is that, can you counter the counter spell? Can I cast fireball, counter spell, uh, counter spell the counter spell. And if you follow sage advice and the like, then the answer to that question is yes. It's two different types of actions, mm -hmm. therefore it uh, falls under. It's a defensive spell so powerful that it conjures its own <laughs> micro universe <laughs> of actions. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we've talked before about, you know, what that might look like and, and you know, the counterspell duel can be boring only when you're just talking in terms of the mechanics. And this is a moment where, as a dungeon master, you might take, you might set aside and go, okay, we know this just happened. Let's talk a minute to see what this looks like and share a moment where we imagine this, this world that we're creating and go mm -hmm. like, all right, I'm forming the bead of fire in my hand as it, I'm about to, to hurl it out and it will explode. All right, the enemy caster, you know, sends a, a you know, a ray of cold at you to attempt to, you know, abort that uh, process uh, and, mm. and, and stop it and you block that yourself by in increasing the intensity of the fireball uh, and bef right before you unleash it and it, you know, goes off. Like, that's just the narration of it. And even taking just that little moment to role play out and describe the back and forth can do a lot to sort of alleviate this. I do this thing. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, <laughs> no, sir, you don't. Yeah, you, yeah. You start to have the inverse of that moment in Blazing Saddles. <laughs> Mr. Johnson is right. There's a cheesy option that I've seen. I've never yeah. had anybody try it, but it involves the uh, specific wording of of uh, ready to action and how ready to actions work with regular spells, which is oh. that you cast it and then you hold it because you're having to concentrate. You have to hold concentration on this spell that you've got. So you would like cast it out of line of sight of the person who would be doing counterspell, and then you step into line of sight after the spell is cast to release it. But to me, that smells like stinky cheese, and I just, it, 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 it's one of those things where, you know, being out of line of sight is a good way to stop someone from counterspelling you, but being out of line of sight is also a great way to not have spell targets to select for your own magic. That is so, true. So, you know, you just, that's the, that's the benefit of it, right? You know yeah. another good way? Mm. Being a sorcerer, taking, <laughs> taking subtle magic. Let me tell you, there was nothing more fun than countering everything while just standing there holding my staff. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, being able to get rid of verbal and somatic components is a big deal for uh, for self spell, and and and, and I think with the, with the counter spell like you're talking about, it it does. It first off, what it makes me want to do is make like an Abjur seventeen sorcerer three. Yeah. And and just like yeah, this they they've got both the mm -hmm. uh, you know the the benefit of being like a high level wizard, the the benefit of being a high level abjurer, plus the subtle spell and probably like heightened spell or something like that. Whichever one lets them gives them a disadvantage on saves. That might be the other one I take for that particular. Bill. Yeah, I think that's heightened spell. Yeah, if you're telling your players what spells your enemies are casting and they're savvy enough to know what level those spells are, and are making their counter ch spell choices based on that, then you're kind of like stacking the deck in the favor of them, uh, you know, abusing this particular spell. And if you just said like, yeah, they're casting a spell and that's it. So uh, mm. that's sort of my fix for it, is to keep that in the dark and, and make it a bit of a gamble uh, for the player. I, Counterspell's a big one, but- Counterspell's a big one, but I mean- I is pretty straightforward. Yeah, I know. I mean, like the, the option of like anti-life shell, I like, I just, first off, I just love that name. Yeah. Anti-life shell. Being able to hedge out anything alive. Yeah, yeah. Anything. Yeah. 
that's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful, yeah. You just, I need some me time. I need right. some me space here, Don't right? Get it. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Like that or anti-magic field, which is a big, I mean, it's a big gamble, right? Right, it's a big gamble. I, I, yeah, and I, I start thinking about like the kind of caster who would have a spell like that because you're basically like shutting off your own ability to cast spells. And so is there a situation where you might use that? Maybe you have, maybe you like sort of sacrifice your ability to cast spells to like make sure the uber bad lich is really taken down mm -hmm. or, or, or something even worse uh, than mm -hmm. that. That, that relies on magic. Well, um, I mean, it's the dedication to uh, a single spell, yeah. which one can do with counterspell, I, and I have seen that done, where you have the caster literally is like, I'm not gonna, no, no, I'm saving all of my slots. Just for to shut big down fat, other casters. Because yeah. we're fighting a big badass caster, yeah. and anything he casts, I'm gonna counter it. Right. And I literally am just gonna, Cantrips one of my, on know, my action. Slots, what are you doing for your, for counter spell. Well, Yeah, what are you doing for your action? Either a cantrip or you know blade ward. Yeah, like um, that, yeah. and then wait for them to cast. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's a completely viable way to play that. And let me tell you, it worked to perfection. Mm. It frustrated the DM to no end, but he was right. like, I can't be angry at somebody who's going to like be that strategic. Yeah, yeah. But doing that with anti magic field, I mean. Yeah, it's pretty be, high level. It's pretty high level. You got to be up close. You are sacrificing your own ability to cast magic, but at least anti magic field goes into very in depth, like what it covers and what it doesn't, how it works. It's a very in depth uh, spell. Mm -hmm. It's just very situational. I also kind of think it's antithetical to the caster because like the caster is about magic. So when I think about the spell, I start thinking like, what influence does that have on the on on the caster? Especially when we start thinking like, for wizards, the magic is in their mind. It's a part of them, right? Like sorcerers sort of like call it up and can create these effects seemingly you know you know just from their being warlocks are granted the the, the knowledge of the spells through their patrons and, and similar with sort of like uh, connection with nature for druids or, or the divine with clerics but for wizards it's like your spells a part of you right so what does it mean to have an anti-magic spell as, as being a part of you mm -hmm. like is, is it like a hole in your being that you're always aware of and you just can't wait to get it out is what is yeah. it you know how does that affect you yeah I would, I, I would imagine it would basically open a black hole in mm. the in the area around and it just sucks all magic into it so yeah. for the caster it would be a very turbulent thing whereas there's a stillness in in mm. the weave around them yeah it, it's clearly doesn't not like completely anti anti you know like no magic period full stop because there's sort of like the background magic of, of D&D that that still persists but uh, it is an unraveling of the the magical foundations of magic that that has to be has to have some kind of effect on the mind of the caster. Right, right. Well, I see that as more of affecting worked magic and not mm. magic that just Arises. permeates sure, that sure, just yeah. is yeah like this yeah. is this is these are like work effect yeah spelling, it, it like worked it, only on the things that have been changed been altered by magic right. some concepts right like, yeah so what are, what are some, some more concepts right? i like the idea uh, uh, of a sensor mage and so a yeah. sensor is like uh, i'm thinking to like say the the, the roman uh, system of government uh, you know this is the stage that you would progress to after being a consul and proconsul and mm -hmm. sort of like a venerable sensor so you not only took the census but you're also kind of there to enforce certain norms and and customs and the like you're, you're there to kind of keep tabs on people make sure those those uh, nouveau riche uh, you know uh, <laughs> aren't getting up to something they shouldn't be getting up to like mm. work like owning a business oh my God. Uh, that kind of thing uh, or, or, or I'm thinking of like the uh, the censors um, you know in the imperial bureaucracy uh, of some periods of China where where it's there you know, there's an elaborate bureaucracy and, and and sort of like entry into it is incredibly difficult but there's also this class of official that's there to keep tabs on others and to make sure they're doing their job and you might not know that they're coming and you might not know that they're there but they work for the, the emperor mm -hmm. himself and so I see the idea of a censor as being like a almost like a court mage and they are the wizard or mage that keeps other casters in line. They're the one that goes, what are you guys doing over here? Yeah, you guys got some uh, diabolical texts? Huh? Mm -hmm. You guys got summoning some devils over here? What you yeah, guys like, studying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that looks like some, uh, just some innocent uh, earth magic over there. Oh, okay, move along. Mm -hmm. and, and it's this sort of uh, a cop wizard, basically, right? And yeah. Well, it, it sounds like the Dai Li from our Avatar. Right? Sure, right. They could be like a secret society. Uh, this could be any number of things. I, I've had campaign worlds where all of the wizards sort of got together and agreed like, hey, there's certain things we're not going to do because we don't want the rest of the world turning against us. 
we're not going to mess with kings and and, you know, and, and emperors and, and the like. And politics is is for you know mortals. You know, we're we're concerned with more weighty matters. Um, and, and in that sense, the a censor would be someone that sort of enforces that. But but other settings where uh, you know the the wizards rule the roost. It's a mageocracy. And in that case, the censor is a literal court wizard who works for the magical emperor empress and. You know, they're there to banish demons, send extra-dimensional creatures home that shouldn't be there. They're, they're there to protect the realm, yeah. uh, as it were. From the workings of magic. From the workings of mm -hmm. magic. And, and, and so, in, in that sense, they need a, a robust magical skill set that offers a lot of tools for them to deal with different threats and protect them. Uh, and, and abjuration seems like a good fit for that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Sounds a little bit like a thought police, too. Uh, well, certainly, I mean, it could, certainly could be, right? Like, there's a lot of sinister undertones to, to, to that. Uh, a little more divination, but still. Sure, but there's uh, abjuration, <laughs> divination. They're, they're sort of uh, close thematic cousins in some ways, because yeah. how do you protect yourself without knowing what the threats are? And mm -hmm. isn't the best protection uh, the knowledge of your enemy and the best defense a good offense? So a, a, an abjurer worth their salt will have a wide variety of spells at their disposal from many different schools of magic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's only, uh, you know, a, a particularly hidebound and narrow-minded uh, mage who would only stick with one school. You know, what, what kind of caster are you? Really? Well, I mean, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. there are different viewpoints of magic. Sure, sure. Um, and that could be uh, just the segue we need to move into this last point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Which, uh, which we've, been, we've been covering all these these schools. Right. So this is the last of the, the magic schools yeah. that we're doing here. And uh, we've, we started this back in, in, in sort of early 2018. Uh, we'd just gotten done with the, the class series. And I was like, well, you know, I'm, I, I want to stick with a, a series of D&D &D shows, but I don't necessarily want to dig deep into to character mechanics that much. It's kind of burned out on it. And I was like, let's take a deep dive into the magic school, schools rather. And what is it that they are, uh, doing, how, how do they work? Uh, the second genesis for this was a, uh, a series of blog posts on the Legendary Pants blog uh, called Legendary Project Arcana. Pants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it was a, um, it, it's their sort of look at uh, the spell schools of D&D, &D, and I was sort of inspired by a, a different take on the spell schools, and are, um, you know, are, are more concerned with internal consistency and reshaping the spell lists to achieve that consistency. I kind of realized that I saw the inconsistencies as a feature, not a bug. Yeah. And they suggested a world in which magic was complex and messy and, and not a, a cut and dried uh, observable force that can be measured and the dimensions of it can be taken. But mm -hmm. the, the fact that so many of the schools seem to be thematic in focus yeah, yeah. And, and, and are there to fulfill a certain narrative purpose, mm -hmm. I wanted to reverse engineer that and think of like, what does this mean for the world that they're in? Yeah, right? I was, yeah, was going to say, how, how, what would you say to someone who said, uh, Jim Davis sounds like he just cast uh, rationalization? Uh, it is a rationalization. It's there to take what uh, some would see as an inconsistency that bothers them and says like, oh, I, I, I hate this. Why aren't all the fire spells in one school? Why aren't all the X spells in this? Why is it that abjuration can summon all of these other effects? All the things that we went into in evocation that we could say about so many other different schools, and we have in some, in some respects in all of them, um, to say like, what if that just reflects the changing nature of magic in this campaign world? For instance, some spells switch schools between editions. What if you take that idea that sometimes uh, uh, healing spells in this school and then sometimes it's in this one and then depending on the addition it could be in another and you look and say like what if through the course of your campaign history's world the dominant form of healing magic has reflected the cure wound spell as the, the, the school that it's from whether it's necromancy, conjuration, evocation, whatever that represents a moment where that's the dominant way of thinking about healing magic. In the case of 5th edition, there's healing magic in five different schools, right? Like mm -hmm. evocation, transmutation, conjuration, abjuration. I could have swore there was another. Necromancy has the raised deads, right? They have like sort yeah. of bringing people back to life. Uh, false life, though, uh, could mm -hmm. be considered. Uh, it's vampiric it's touch. tagged a vampire touch, right? So mm -hmm. Those are, those are uh, ta they have the healing tags, at least, in yeah. uh, the D&D Beyond database. Hit points change, uh, change place. Sure. And so, like, all of those represent different approaches to healing magic. What does that mean about your world? Are there competing philosophies of magic that have uh, different cycles of, of influence? 
uh, in your campaign world history. Uh, do these do the schools also represent certain guilds or or as their name suggests, actual schools of magic, mm -hmm. a place where you go to be taught a particular philosophy and approach to in order to achieve a certain effect? Uh, not necessarily a, a scientific way of like, oh, we're studying the, the force of conjuration in the world. We're, we're like, no, this is the school of conjuration, one of the oldest and most venerable schools. Uh, and here we learn about the finer points of uh, you know, moving things across uh, the planar boundaries and summoning them to us. And, and that, maybe that influences the personality of the, the caster, the, the way that they approach situations outside of magic. Um, all of those things can be reflected in your campaign world, and you can build lore and, and history and eventually conflict uh, based on that. Um, in terms of just inconsistencies with the spells themselves and the fact that some spells seem to belong in one school and are in another, or produce an effect that would suggest they belong in even multiple schools. Let's take a spell like Imprisonment, ninth level spell. It's got a variety of effects for it. And those effects might be conjuration-based, transmutation-based, they might be enchantment-based. There's all different ways in which you could organize this spell, particularly ones that have lots of different effects. And so that leads me to, the, to believe that what we need in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition are multi-school spells. Yeah. Spells that really embrace the fact that they draw on multiple schools' approach to magic and philosophy of magic to create an effect. And that a, a spell that combines, say, conjuration and, and divination is a spell that maybe summons a spirit of knowledge and binds it to you for a time that, gain, you, that you gain some benefit from. And, uh, or, or it uh, you know, conjures a being from the future that you question uh, and, and, you know, uh, have a conversation with in order to gain some insight uh, into your present. And um, those are the, the sorts of effects that when you start thinking of multi-school, and as, as you get into, like, creating your own spells and, and, and making your own magic, uh, subject for a future episode, then you can expand your conceptual horizons for what magic can do by looking at it as, as like, stop worrying about the consistencies and just accept that these are... Uh, thematic focuses and then build from there yeah and 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 then you can have a lot of you can do a lot of really interesting things like what does that suggest about your world right like, oh uh, yeah I mean and, and the thing is is when it comes to inconsistencies this book was met, written by people and in a meta sense uh, there are people in this in these worlds so there's going to be very weird different viewpoints on how you can achieve a certain effect Oh, sure, right. and, and, not, and not just the current iteration of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. We're talking about uh, the D and D is, is, is at this point in his existence it owes a, a lot to everyone who has ever had a hand a, at the wheel to to shape this. And mm -hmm. from from 1974 onwards, it's it's been shaped by multitudes of people and, and the fans as well, right? Not just the game designers and developers, at TSR or Wizards, but people who've played it, yeah. and the people who've played it have had an impact on it. And so it's going to produce inconsistencies. It's it's going to be weird. It's going to be jumbled. It's, it's different generations of D&Ders are going to emphasize one thing about the game they like over another. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to piss off the, <laughs> those who are still around from the prior generation of mm -hmm. gamers. And those things, though, we can use that. And instead of railing against it, saying, like, why isn't it like this? Why isn't it more like that? Why can't we, like, have a, a more internally consistent? Uh, and if you do, please go check out that Project Arcana. They, it seems like they, they did a really cool job with bringing some consistency uh, to it over there. But for me, I, I like the inconsistency because it suggests something about the world that I like. Yeah. It suggests a world where uh, cadres of, of, of wizards, uh, you know, beat each other up in, in street brawls. Magic is such a part of a caster, right? Why wouldn't it be the defining thing about the casters, sort of like their approach to magic, as exemplified by the spell schools or, or, or by the type of caster they are, cleric, uh, you know, druid, etc. That's their, one of their defining features, and, and it, you owe it, uh, player or DM, to like really dig in and think about these things and have conversations with each other about what that means for the world and how you want to portray this. And that's how you build shared investment mm -hmm. and, and get a game where everybody's like uh, gung ho about, you know? Yeah. I guess Damn. it's uh, fitting we saved abjuration for last uh, to build a good defense for the schools of spells. Absolutely, yeah. I, I yeah, I'm I'm 100. Like I might have started this journey kind of like ugh, these inconsistent ugh. spell schools. But by the end of it, I'm like, yeah, these inconsistent spell schools. Like, aren't they great? Like, yeah. this is what they they add something to the world uh, rather than detract from it.
head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. got some of the concepts that we can get to there like i think the cool concept maybe travis can use this for like a sting or something it's like a glyph mage right like oh a rune shit, mage, yeah. right like so, like to me the abjurer as a wizard is really cool for it because you get that like t- hp buffer which you can describe as like runes on your on your armor or something or if they're like a mountain dwarf you know that gets mm-hmm. the that gets the ac uh or the armor proficiency um or the uh a demon ghost hunter mage is, kind of, is another kind of cool one one that's Ooh. like uh I hunt goat. I'm an exorcist kind of thing. Like, oh, uh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Arcane exorcist. Oh, by binding them ghosts, banishing them? Yeah, binding ghosts, mm-hmm. banishing like them. Like, not, yeah, the, you're the totally, the not holy guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the ghost. You're Constantine. Guy. It's like, a, and it's, kind like, or of. Constantine is kind of like that, or like, there's some like kung fu tropes, like character tropes that are like that. These sort mm-hmm. of like the wandering mystic, where they're sort of, you know, they're like maybe a monk, maybe not, maybe a sorcerer, maybe not. But if you've got ghosts around, you want this guy on your side. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they certainly are not scared of any ghosts. There needs to be a ghost puncher monk class. Ghost punch.